Children are now tyrants. This is Socrates describing a new generation of Athenians nearly two and a half thousand years ago. Similarly, Plato argued nearly two and a half thousand years ago that no one was fit to lead until they were 50. These ancient Aegis absurdities, sociologist Dr. David Finkler quotes in his paper The Internet, Youth Safety and the Problem of Juvenoia, in which he portmanteaus the words juvenile and paranoia, coining the term juvenoia. The term, which has in recent years entered the public consciousness, is broadly defined as the fears an older generation holds about a younger one, colloquially known as the you millennials attitude. Hello, my name is Anna Timchenko, and while I'm not a millennial, I am a member of the youth in question. Here to talk to you about juvenile limiting our opportunities, and more importantly, how we fix it. We've all experienced juvenile in some way, most often through conversational phrases, including but not limited to. Kids these days, back in my day, why is everybody nowadays so addicted to technology? And generationally, these conversational phrases have been relatively harmless. However, we're in an era of shifting demographics, where specifically in Western nations, the youth are now a statistical minority. This means even the tame forms of juvenile help nurture stereotypes which have harmful real-world implications. To examine this point further, let's take a look at the workforce. In an Olivet Nazarene University study, out of 1,025 respondents, ages 56 to 74, when asked, what annoys you most about a younger colleague? 48% of responded, respondents said smartphone usage, 41% said sense of entitlement, and 35% of respondents said laziness. As a result of these quite ageist generalizations, out of the 1,005 respondents in the same study, now ages 24 to 39, 30% claimed that an older colleague was preventing them from advancing. This is juvenile acting as quantifiable ageism. Another harmful manifestation of juvenile is the neglect of social issues endemic to young people. Increasingly, young people have been called lazy because of the declining rate of home ownership. Advocates of this narrative, particularly the baby boomers, cite their own rapid acquisition of wealth as proof that instant success is possible if you just work hard enough. And according to CNBC, the number of homes owned by people ages 25 to 34 is 8% less than the amount owned by the, uh, by the previous generation at the same age. However, the belief that young people own less homes because of laziness or even a pension for avocado toast is greatly oversimplified. It negates the fact that in the 1999 to 2000 academic school year alone, college tuition prices rose by 68%. This continual increase in college tuition prices leads to, on average, according to Forbes in the United States, to $33,000 of student debt per borrower. Moreover, tuition prices continue to rise globally. So, it's an increase in tuition prices, crippling amounts of student debt, and lack of starter homes that are the causes for the lack of homes owned by young people not Juvenoia's alleged laziness. Another harmful manifestation of Juvenoia is that its belief that young people are somehow incapable leads to political underrepresentation for young people. This is supplemented by a practice Dr. Finkler refers to as political demagoguery. Political demagoguery may be further broken down into two facets, active and passive. Active refers to the use of legislative power to combat the effects of social change on the youth. This includes things such as passing a policy, such as an age minimum, to run for government, an extreme example being Tajikistan's minimum age of 30. On an economic paradigm, this looks like Australia's tax system disproportionately benefiting older Australians. And while active demagoguery may seem fatalistic, it's uncommon. The true issue lies with passive demagoguery, the discouragement of youth participation in politics due to ageist attitudes. It's Plato's two and a half thousand year old still prevalent belief that you must be 50 or older in order to lead successfully. A bizarre assertion because according to the UN, that's over half the global life expectancy. But the prevalence of such attitudes leads to the youth being barred from the global legislative process. 
According to a 2017 Cambridge Press study, even though people ages 18 to 35 are, are a demographic globally three times the size of that people ages 60 and above, only 10% of the global legislative process includes people ages 18 to 35. Hence, Juvenoia not only hands society the carte blanche to disregard issues systemic to young people, it also actively strips young people of the tools to solve those issues. To clarify, Juvenoia, or the fears an older generation holds about a younger one, is based on assumptions from one's youth rather than fact. Rates, rates of teen violence are only 12% of what they were as recently as two decades ago. Teen drug usage is on the decline. So statistically speaking, every contemporary generation is better off than its predecessor, contrary to Juvenoia's claims. Yet, if Juvenoia's allegations are so easily disputable, but it's still an age-old phenomenon, what can we do about it? Talk and listen. It's from small misunderstandings that larger issues arise. I myself am guilty of unintentional rudeness towards the older generation, not picking up the phone two or five or three times when a grandparent calls. Suddenly, compounding, compounding these instances with a culture that facilitates ageist stereotypes, and now my grandparents consider the entirety of my generation rude, detached, arrogant, and insolent. Suddenly, we're barred from work prosperity and political representation. So we rise above these stereotypes by being approachable and proving that we are, in fact, a statistically well-rounded generation. From contemporary musicians to prolific figures such as Socrates, we are told the kids aren't all right. I say we're turning out just fine. <laughs> 